Good morning, everyone. I hope you are doing well. Today, I get to sing for you all. I'm just kidding. You do not want that. You do not want that. But no, my name is uh, Sam Dalton. Uh, I'm the youth and young adult minister here. Uh, and I just want to welcome all that are here and all that are watching online with us this morning. Uh, and I hope that you guys are having a wonderful week uh, as it's been really nice out the last couple days after we got some rain. Uh, and if this is your first time here with us, I just encourage you to uh, see one of us uh, or see one of the greeters in the back uh, to fill out a guest card. Or you can, um, we got fancy and technological, and you can see the cue cards in front of you and scan that, and that'll take you to the guest card as well. And I just hope you guys have a wonderful service as we worship here uh, this morning. And we want to connect with each and every one of you uh, whether you've been here for 30 years or if this is your first week. Uh, let's go ahead and pray uh, to get started. God, I just thank you so much for this wonderful time that we've had uh, this week with this wonderful weather, and I just pray that this, this morning that we are able just to worship you uh, together and just worship uh, just your, your son uh, and, and what he did uh, and, and just the sacrifice that he made for us. And I just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand and let's worship together.
As we uh, gather here this morning, I'm reminded of a story that I once heard, I once read about not long ago in Detroit, a man by the name of James Robinson made headlines when it was reported this 56-year-old man would walk 21 miles, take two buses in order to get to his job. 
Now, I don't know about your commute, but that's a long commute. And because of his long commute and because of the, the time that it took him just traveling back and forth from, from work to home, it, the, the reporter said that he was only able to get two hours sleep every night. Now, if, if that was me, Richard, I, I like my sleep. But I, really, sometimes Sunday morning I wake up, oh, do I got to go? Right? Yes, I, I love my sleep. But he only got two hours sleep. Well, there was a college student who, who heard about this. So he decided to take it on himself to start a GoFundMe page. And he was able to, in the end, raise and, and give to Robinson $350,000 plus a new car. That's a pretty incredible story. It's an incredible story. And, and it is also, we, we see it, 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 it's also true that in, in our lives, there are people in need all around us. There are people in need all around us, and it's not that we don't know those people or, or necessarily we don't want to help those people, but, but we don't take the time to get to know them. We don't get to take the time to, to really see how God could allow me to work in the life of this other person. And as a church, that is what we desire most, to be able to reach out and to, to impact a community with the good news of the gospel. Because, folks, no matter who you are, the greatest need in your life, even here today, is the gospel. It is the gospel. So the point I'm trying to make here this time of offering and reflection as we look forward as the church, as the body of Christ, how can we get to know our community in a way that is going to impact the mission in a way that not only glorifies God, but also it reaches them with the gospel. Amen? Let's pray. Lord gracious, Heavenly Father, God, I thank you, Lord, for this time that you've allowed us to gather in your presence. And God, we thank you for this time of generosity where many... Um, will give of themselves, will we'll give financially, will give physically, Lord, as they seek to glorify you, as they seek to reach a lost and dying world. And Lord, we ask that you continue to, to move in this church, you continue to move among your people, that you help us be the, the people that you've called us to be, help us be the body of Christ. In Jesus' name, I pray. If you would, go ahead and turn your copies of God's Word here this morning. Uh, we're going to be looking at Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24, as we continue in our sermon series titled, Beginnings. Now, I want to start this sermon off by saying a couple things. First and, and foremost, I want you to know 
that as your pastor, I love you. I love you. And the reason I want you to know that I love you is because what I'm going to speak about here this morning is very controversial. Now, it shouldn't be controversial. And what I mean by it shouldn't be controversial, we, we see how clearly Scripture talks about this. But even with that said, our culture, the culture, the society we live in has pushed back. And what I mean by, by push back is, is what we are defining here today, what we are talking about here today is not, is not the norm, or at least in the context of biblical theology or, or biblical interpretation. So this morning, we are going to talk about marriage, right? Who in here is married? Or been married, right? You, you're married? All right, so just because you didn't raise your hand does not mean this message isn't for you. And, and because I, I believe it is for every single one of us, no matter who you are, no matter how long you've been married or if you've ever been married, it's important for us to know the Word of God. And that's what, what our focus is going to be here this morning, is we're going to look and to see the Word of God and, and, and not only what is marriage, but why did God create marriage? You know God created marriage, right? Why did God institute marriage? When the actor Sylvester Stallone was, was making one of his Rocky movies right after one of the fight scenes. Anybody like watching Rocky? All right, right after one of the fight scenes, he, he made this statement. He says, you know, boxing is a great sport as long as you can yell cut. As long as you can yell cut. Well, unfortunately, many people feel the same way when it comes to marriage. They feel the same way when it comes to to marriage. It is, it's a lot of fun as long as you can yell cut when it gets too difficult. As most of you already know, marriage is difficult. Marriage is difficult. It doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter how long you've, you've been married. Marriage is difficult. It takes work. It takes a, a lot of work and sacrifice. There is no such thing as a picture perfect marriage there's no such thing you're like well pastor why it is because there is no such thing as a picture perfect husband or why why it's because we've all sinned we've all fallen short of the glory of god the problem is not that that we have not looked hard enough to find that that perfect husband or that that perfect wife the, the problem that we face here today in our culture, the, the problem that we face even within our church is the fact that we have not looked hard enough to the picture-perfect God in order to be that foundation within our marriage, within our marriages. Statistically, it has been said that over 50% of all marriages end in divorce. Over 50%. And, and that's not just talking about Sectorally, that's just not talking about outside the church. But even within the church, over 50% of marriages end in divorce. I do not know about you, but this statistic breaks my heart. It breaks my heart because I know, personally, I know the pain and the hurt that divorce can cause. Right? I know the, the, the difficulty that, that it could bring on the family. So today, we will examine the first marital union between both a man and a woman. We will explore three key points from the, the sermon titled, Two is One. And no matter, as stated, no matter if you, you are married, you've ever been married, you will ever be married, or even if you just know somebody who is married, this applies to you. As we look and see how marriage within our text, how, how it identifies to the God of all creation. I would like to start by asking a question. And the question, this is a very debatable question, and, and it is this. Is marriage still relevant in the 21st century? Is it? As a church, how would we answer that question? Because the culture is saying something much different 
So, so how would we answer that in our, cult, in our churches here today? Is marriage still relevant? And although this question may seem obvious to most, as stated, cultural trends show that fewer and fewer people are getting married, and the number of couples who are living together outside of the context of biblical marriage has skyrocketed in most recent years, even among Christian circles. Hear me. I am not here today to pass judgment. I'm not here to pass judgment on anyone. I am only here as your pastor, as a, as a, uh, a minister of the gospel, to speak about what the Bible says when it comes to the importance of marriage and the important part that it plays within both family and culture. So that brings us to our text. So in honor of reading God's word, if you could please stand with me here this morning as we look at Genesis chapter 2, beginning in verse 18 through 24. And the word of God says, Then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. Now out of the ground the Lord God had formed every beast of the field, and every bird of the heavens, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all livestock, and to the birds of the heavens, and to every beast of the field. But for Adam, there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed it up and placed it, replaced it with flesh. In the rib that the Lord God had taken from the man, he made into a woman and brought her to the man. Then the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman because she was taken out of man. Therefore... A man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Let us pray. Lord gracious, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this time that you've allowed us to gather in your presence. And God, I ask that you continue to move in our hearts, that you continue to move in our lives, that you use this text, that you use your word in order to draw us close to you, to help us see the desire that you have to, to share in a relationship with every one of us. And God, we ask that you continue to move in our lives, that you help us be the people that you called us to be. In Jesus' name, I pray these things. Amen. You may be seated. As stated this morning, we are going to dissect Genesis chapter 2, verses 18 through 24. In order to discover God's plan and purpose for marriage. Who in here wants to know God's plan and purpose for marriage? Yes. All right, we, we want to know that. And first, as we dig in, first we see the biblical model of marriage. Did you know there is a biblical model for marriage? You know what a model is? Anybody know what a model is? Model is something we kind of look to. Anybody like putting together model cars when you were a kid? I, I enjoyed doing that, putting together model cars or model boats. Enjoyed doing that. Um, what, what is a model? A model is something that represents something else, right? It, it, it's not just something, if I was to create art and just, just put, throw things together, that's not a model. It, it's not a representation of something else other than my mixed up mind sometimes, right? But um, maybe it would be abstract. I don't know. But, but the, the Bible models marriage there there is a model for marriage when we look at what is marriage supposed to be we we do have a perfect model we do have a perfect model and we'll get there uh, shortly but first we see in verse 18 through 20 we see what's happening we see the lord he just created everything he created man and it says in our text verse 18 the lord god said he said it is not good that man should be alone so i will make him a helper that is fit. I'll make him a helper that is fit. Verse 19, it goes on. It says, Now out of the ground the Lord God had, had formed every beast of the field and every bird of the heavens and brought them to the man 
to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all the livestock and to the birds of the heavens and to every beast of the field. But hear this. But for Adam, for the man, there was, there was not found a helper fit for him. He was alone. He was alone, and God saw it was not good for man to be alone. So we see a helper. A helper does not mean that, that Adam, that the man, was flawed in his design. God didn't mess up. Right? He didn't forget to do something. Now, I know what some of you ladies are thinking. Well, you haven't met my husband. If I only knew before I signed that paper, maybe things would be different. The word helper means that, that man was not yet finished. He was not yet finished. God was still working in him. He was still, still uh, making his life. And unlike other creatures on earth, mankind was created to be intimate with his heavenly creator. We discussed that last week. Mankind was created. He was created to be intimate with his heavenly creator. Both men and women are made in the image of God, in the image of God, allowing them to share in a, in a triune relationship with the Lord of all creation. Men and women were not created to be independent from one another. They are created to be interdependent. What do I mean by interdependent? Completeness. They complete one another. This is why we see earlier in Scripture, in chapter 1, and even here in chapter 2, humanity, mankind, is referred to as what? Man and woman. Not just man and man alone. Last week in Genesis 1, 20, 26 through 27, you remember, it said that, that God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness, and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, and over the birds of the heavens, and over the livestock, and over, over all the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Here it is. Are you ready? Are you ready? Are you ready? No one's ready. Come on. What's the deal? Are you asleep? Man and female, or male and female, he created them. We also read in Genesis chapter 5, verse 1 and 2, it says this. It says, this is the book of, of the generations of Adam when God created man. He made him in the likeness of God, male and female. He created them. Notice the plural that is used. The, the pluralism verse, versus the singular um, speech for both God and man. This does not mean that, that we serve, in a sense, three gods. That's not what this text is saying. We serve only one God who is represented in three distinct persons, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, each sharing in a triune relationship with the other. However, remaining unified as a whole. Unified as a whole. This means each subject within the Godhead is not, is not independent, meaning it's not separate, but again, it is interdependent. It's all one. Oftentimes, we try to communicate the Trinity. Right? Anybody ever talk about the Trinity? You hear about the Trinity? Um, the Trinity is probably, in the, in the Christian mind, it is the most difficult thing to communicate. And, and what, I've, what I've learned, any time that I've tried to illustrate the Trinity in some way, some form, some fashion, I oftentimes fail. And what I mean by that, I'll give an example, is, is sometimes we communicate this God, and who in here has ever heard, I won't ask if you've ever used it, but who in here has ever heard of the egg analogy when it refers to God? There's actually a, uh, a heretical uh, term for this, and it is called partialism. Partialism. What I mean by this? Well, oftentimes we, we use an egg, the, the three parts of an egg to illustrate the Trinity, well, the problem with using an egg 
to illustrate the Trinity is the fact that the egg shell, the egg yolk, and the egg white is not a full egg. It's not fully an egg. It's part of an egg. But when we talk about the Trinity, when we talk about God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit, each person is fully God. It's not just a part of God, right? It is fully God. So I just throw that out as caution when we try to illustrate, use any illustration to communicate the Trinity. It is only a single component. He is only a single component which makes it, which makes each component, again, in need for one another. The point that I'm trying to make is this. The Trinity is inseparable. That's the point. That's the point I'm trying to make. The, the Trinity is inseparable. Each subject within the Godhead is fully God in himself, yet interdependent as a divine Lord over all. Likewise, the marital relationship. The marital relationship was designed by God to be two in one. Although each person is an individual, they are meant to be interdependent as one behind me you see an illustration this this illustration has helped me just kind of work out in my own mind of of marriage and the triune relationship why how god has created man how god has created woman to to share in that relationship and as you notice that relationship is not meant to be just a man and a woman it is meant to be tri means what three Right? It is meant to be the husband, the wife, and God. And God, we are to share in order for a husband to be the man, to be the husband that God has called him to be. He just, not, he just doesn't grow close to his wife, but he grows closer to God. Husbands, if you want to be the husband God has called you to be, stop trying to just woo your wife and worship God. Right? Worship God. Draw closer to God. Wives. Instead of, uh, if, if, if you want to be that wife that God has called you to be, likewise, focus on your relationship with God, if not more so than our own spouses. Because the only way that a husband can be the husband God designed, and the only way that a wife can be the wife that God designed is if we, if we place the foundation for that relationship on God. And as you re recognize, there's a problem. And we'll get to this next week, but I'll hit on it right now. And that problem is sin. Why is there no such thing as a picture-perfect marriage? It's because of sin. We've already said that. It's because of sin. But Jesus, Jesus brings us together. Not only does he mend our relationship with one another, but he also mends, he reconciles our relationship with our creator. So we see this triune, this model the triune relationship that's modeled after God himself as a triune God. This goes to show that marriage was not only mandated by God, but, but the model for marriage was found and is found in God. So we see the biblical model of marriage. Secondly, we see in our text, we see the biblical method of marriage. It says in verse 21, it goes on, 23 says so the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man See, I knew sleep was good I said that a moment ago and while he slept God took one of his ribs and he closed up its place with flesh and the rib that that the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman and brought her to the man then the man said, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman. Why? It's because she was taken out of man. Woman is the completion of man, not the alternative. Woman is the completion of man, not the alternative. From the very beginning of creation, God's model for marriage has been a holy union between one man 
and one woman. To, full, to, to fulfill our, our, our physical, our, bio, our biological, our, our social, and even our spiritual purposes, mankind must stay true to God's intended design. We must stay true to God's intended, intended design. We do not choose the selection of our genders. This, too, is the work of God. It is the work of God. David writes. David says in the Psalms, in Psalms 1, uh, 139, verse 13, he says this. He says, for you, talking about God, for you formed, me in, formed my inward parts. You knitted me together in my mother's womb. Who did that? God did that. God did that. The problem humanity faces today is the fact that, that many people have taken upon themselves to redesign that which has already been made. To redesign that which has already been made. In other words, they, they take what God has created, not just, not just uh, genetically, but also institutionally. Remember, I said this last week, I believe, that marriage in the family, it is the, the first institution that has been, that, that God created. God created. In Scripture, God was, was specific about his design and, and his method of holy matrimony. Anybody here? Now, some of you, be cautious. Your parents are sitting real close, okay? So when I don't just uh, reflect, right, and raise your hand, make sure they're not looking. But uh, here it is. Anybody here ever go too fast in your car? You ever guilty of speeding? Yeah. Yeah. I, I have. I've gotten a speeding ticket. I'll admit it. And right, I've gotten a speeding ticket. But, um. When, when you go too fast in a car and you go around a curve, oftentimes there are, there are things in place to keep that car from being like a rocket and just launching off the road. Right, and those things are called what? Do you know? All right, guardrails. Right, the, the guardrails that, that are on the side of a road oftentimes, especially around a curve, it is to keep people from going off the road if they are going too fast or if they lose control of their car. To veer from God's design is like steering a car into a guardrail. To veer from God's design, it is like steering a car into the guardrail. Cars were never meant to drive through guardrails. They were meant to drive on the road. Your car was meant to stay on the road. You may not go through the guardrail, and over the side of the mountain, when you hit the when you hit the steel barrier, but you will damage your car every time. If you hit a guardrail, you will damage your car. This is also true when it comes to God's biblical mandate and method for marriage. You may not go over the cliff, but the damage will happen. There will be damage. In his letter to the church of Rome, the Apostle Paul, he warns the church not to exchange the truth for a lie. Or specifically, the truth about God for a lie. In verse 25 of chapter 1. This is what happens when we try to tamper with God's method. When we try to tamper with, with God's design for marriage. Paul writes, and this is God's word, he says, For this reason God gave them up to dishonorable passions. For their women exchanged natural relations with those that are contrary to nature. And the men likewise gave up natural relations with women and were consumed with passion for one another, men committing shameless acts with men and receiving in themselves the due penalty for their error, the damage. 
And since they did, did not see fit to acknowledge God, God gave them up to a, to a debased mind to do what ought not to be done. So what is unbiblical marriage? When we talk about unbiblical marriage, what, what does the Bible say? Well, first we see, as we just read in the text, it is unnatural union. And what I mean by unnatural unions, we're talking about same-sex marriages. But before we strike out too quickly, let me share with you something. I've had a lot of relationships with people over the years who struggle with homosexuality. And what I mean by that, not only people within the church, but also people within my own family who struggle with the sin of homosexuality. And it's easy for us who cannot empathize or we cannot understand how somebody can act in such fashion, such, in such ways that, that just blows our mind. It blows our mind. But, but what I try to do in, in myself and my own reason is I try to understand where they're coming from. And I want to give you an illustration that I oftentimes use as I speak to a person who struggles with this sin. It is sin. As we see, the Bible clearly says it is sin. No matter who, what pastor says different, it is sin. It is sin. I was once having a conversation with a young lady, and we were close. We had a close relationship with each other, and, um, and I noticed in our conversation she got really quiet. Like she was thinking about something, and you, can, you could see that, you could tell that something was weighing on her. And this, this woman, this, this young lady, she was uh, professed to be, to, be, to be a homosexual. That was, that was her statement. And she made the statement to me, her, her worry was that I wouldn't want to have anything to do with her. Now, this woman wasn't just a woman. This was a woman in my family. It was somebody I loved. It was somebody who loved me. But she knew who I was at that time. I was a youth pastor. She knew that I was a, I was a minister of the gospel, and she knew what the Bible said about her life choice. She knew what the Bible said, and, and she was afraid that I wouldn't want to have anything to do with her because of that. Now, it kind of blew my mind at that moment because we were already having a relationship with each other. We were talking at that moment. And the argument that you oftentimes hear from people, and I know young people, you hear this at school, you hear this in the culture that we live in today, is, well, I was born this way. Anybody heard that? Even as a pastor, I will never disagree with that. Because in, our, in reality, I agree with that. And what I mean by, by I agree with that, and I shared with her this illustration that I'm going to share with you right now. Say there was a man who had a job, and he worked in an office. One day, this man, being a married man and having a family, this man met a new secretary or administrative assistant. And he thought she was attractive. And she thought that he was attractive. So the two went off and they had an affair. Now I can ask most people if this is an okay thing to do. And you would say, no, absolutely not. But the man could use the same argument that you hear for homosexuality. You can use that same argument when it comes to heterosexuality as the man had natural attraction. He had natural attractions to this woman. So that must mean it's okay, right? No. So what makes it wrong? What makes it, what makes it wrong is because both are equally wrong. Because it is outside of God's, mes it is outside of God's method. It's outside of God's model. It's outside of God's purpose and plan for marriage. It's a distortion of of what God designed. So I shared this with this young lady, helping her understand, and I, I would like to say that, that I changed her mind right there on the spot, 
but that didn't happen. Because as you know with sin and the sin that you struggle with, it's a lifelong battle. It's a lifelong battle. So the point is, we see these unbiblical marriages, these unbiblical unions. First, we see it is, it is the unnatural union. Secondly, I spoke on just a minute ago, you see it is the unfaithful unions. What I mean by unfaithful, these are marriages where one spouse is unfaithful to the other or, or what are considered to be open marriages. That goes on too. Another unbiblical form of, of union, form of marriage, is unequal union. Oh, man, Pastor. You don't want to come back next week, do you? What do I mean by unequal union? These are Christians who marry unbelievers. Scripture. I'm going to just read Scripture to you. It says in 2 Corinthians 6, 14, Paul writes, he says, Do not be unequally yoked with unbelievers. For what partnership has righteousness with lawlessness? And what fellowship has light with darkness? This verse does not mean that if you at any time in your life have, have married an unbeliever, that you should automatically right now, tomorrow, go out and file for divorce. No. That's not what I am saying. My mom used to always say this. Two wrongs don't make a right. Two wrongs don't make a right. So, so pastor, what are you saying? You are to love your spouse. No matter if they are a believer or an unbeliever. You are to love them as Christ loved the church. Even before the church was a believer. I'm so thankful that God didn't view my sin and say, nope, not for me. So we see not only unequally, unequal unions being unbiblical, but also unpledged unions. What do I mean by unpledged unions? This is cohabitation or uncommitted. This even includes as we spoke briefly earlier, divorce. And although the Bible does allow for divorce under certain circumstances, I know some of you are thinking that right now, know this, divorce was never God's idea. When God created Adam and Eve, marriage is meant to last how long? A lifetime, right? We'll talk more about this in another sermon. Now, do not misunderstand what I'm saying here today. As Christians, it is not our responsibility to condemn people who go against their God-given design when it comes to marriage. But as followers of Christ, you and me, as followers of Christ, we must stay true to the method of marriage within our individual lives. We must live out that model. Only then can the world truly see marriage as God intended. Only then can the world see, can the world truly see the message of God that is communicated through his design of marriage. Some of you may disagree with me here today. If so, it is important for you to understand you do not disagree with me you disagree with God this is God's word the Bible makes it clear when it comes to the model and the method of marriage so the question the real question that, that you must answer the real question that, that I must answer is this do you believe the Bible do you truly believe it so we see the biblical model of marriage. We see the biblical method of marriage. And lastly, our last point here this morning, we see the biblical, the biblical model, the biblical method, the biblical message of marriage. Verse 24. Therefore, a man shall leave his father and mother and hold fast 
to his wife, and they shall become one flesh. Two is one. The message of biblical marriage not only communicates unity between both, both the husband and the wife, but also it communicates God's unity with mankind. That, that trying relationship he shares with mankind. It is a beautiful picture unlike anything else. Biblical marriage teaches all generations, past, present, and future, what it means to truly love as God loves us. We read in Paul's letter, to the church of Ephesus, he says this. He says, therefore, be imitators of God as beloved children and walk in love. Say those three words with me. Walk in love as Christ loved us and gave himself up for us, a fragrant of offering and sacrifice to God. So how do we do this? In our marriages, how do... How do we walk in love, especially when it comes to marriage? Marriage, it is a message of unfailing commitment. Marriage is a message of unfailing commitment. If you're sitting next to your spouse, look at them. I like doing stuff like this. So you're not perfect. Don't sock your husband when he says that to you. I told him to say that. I'm not perfect, but we love each other anyway. Marriage is a message of unfailing commitment, that that loyalty to one another. The Apostle Paul, he, he, he goes on in verses 22 and 24. He says this. Are you ready? Here it is. Wives. Submit to your own husband as to the Lord, for the husband is the head of the wife, even as Christ is the head of the church, his body, and is himself its Savior. Now as the church submits to Christ, so also wives should submit in everything to their husbands. I know what some of you ladies are thinking right now. I can't believe our pastor used that kind of foul language here. How dare him say that I need to submit to my husband? Have you met this guy? Unfortunately, the word submit has created division among the sexes in most recent years. Is the Bible saying, really saying, that a wife must do everything that a husband tells her to do? To submit, to submit to your husband does not mean that he is superior to you. That's not what it says. That's not what it's saying. That's not what Paul is communicating. He is not saying that the husband has more value than you. It is not, it, it has nothing to do with value. It has everything to do with honor. Not only honoring your husband, but also honoring God. In his design and his purpose for you as a wife. To submit means to place one's trust in another. To trust in them as you follow them. I do not know one woman who does not want to trust her husband. Anybody here not want to trust your husband? I don't know any woman who doesn't want to trust your husband. It is natural to desire to trust your husband, even when sometimes it's hard to trust him. Does that happen? The desire is there. Likewise, such submission is to have trust in God's design. I understand this can be a difficult thing to do sometimes. It can. It is hard to to let go, and to allow someone else to lead. It is hard. It is difficult. Even when you know that it is the right thing to do, it is still difficult. This leads me to another observation. 
the reason why wives, I believe, many wives sometimes struggle when it comes to fully submitting to their husbands is because their husbands have not really given them full reason to trust them. That's why. That's why. So what do I mean by this? We'll see it in our next sub-point. Not only do we see the, the message of marriage is unfailing commitment, but also the message, message of marriage, it is unconditional love. Unconditional love. Paul goes on in Ephesians chapter 25. He goes on. He's not just picking on wives. Here, here comes the husbands. He says, husbands, husbands, are you listening? Oh, yeah, I guess. <laughs> Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the, with the word, so that he might present the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Ladies, If your husband loved you as Christ loved the church and was willing to give himself up for you, you would have no problem in submitting to him. No problem. Why? It is because his actions would be both sacrificial and selfless. So it's not serving a tyrant, but it's his Desire to lead is in your best interest, even above his own. When God created marriage, it was for the good of humanity and the glory of himself. Not only was was marriage designed to benefit humanity, but it was also meant to be the building block of the family and ultimately our culture. The first marriage was ordained by God and designed to be a righteous union before God and all creation. So, beloved, no matter if you are married or not, know this. God wants you to share in a relationship with him. With him. So will you choose to walk with Jesus? Even when the road becomes difficult, even when society says something much different, will you live in a manner that is honoring to God, no matter what marital status may be tomorrow in our culture? Will you take your next step with Jesus today, right now? Let us pray. Every head bowed, eyes closed as we conclude here today. Maybe your next step is to receive Jesus Christ as your Lord and personal Savior. The scripture says in Romans 3.23, it says, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. And because of that sin in my life, because of that sin in your life, not only can we not be the man that God or the woman that God has called us to be, But we cannot be the spouse that God has called us to be. We cannot be the parent that God has called us to be. We cannot be the citizen that God has called us to be apart from him. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin, for the wages of sin is death. But it goes on and says, but the gift of God, the gift of God is eternal life through Christ Jesus our Lord. Maybe today you give your heart to Jesus. Maybe today you give your life to Jesus. Maybe today you give your marriage to Jesus. Maybe today you give your family to Jesus. Maybe today your next step is to become a covenant member here at First Baptist Church or to follow the Lord and believers' baptism as we openly profess our faith in Him. Or maybe that next step for you 
to seek the Lord in a prayer of desperation. That should be all of our next steps, just saying. Or maybe that next step should be as we come together to trust in the Lord, as we partner with one another, seeking to fulfill our mission, our, our vision here at First Baptist Church of connecting with our community by meeting people where they are just as Jesus did. Whatever your next step may be, today is the day to trust in the Lord. Today is the day to follow Jesus. Today is the day to recognize that all humanity was created both by God and for God. It is through our relationships, even our marriages, that we are called to honor Him. Let us pray. Lord gracious, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you, Lord, for this time again that you've allowed us to come together, Lord, to study your word. And God, I ask that you continue to move in our hearts, that you continue to move in our lives. Lord, you know we fall short. You know that there are many here within this room who have not lived up to the model. We've not lived up to your purpose and your plan. But God, we praise you for your grace and we praise you for your mercy. And we ask that you continue to work in our lives, that you heal our relationships, and that you draw us close to not only each other, but also to you. And God, thank you, and we praise you for all you do. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Please stand and sing with us. Change my heart, oh God, make it ever true. Change my heart, oh God, may I be like you. Change my heart, oh God.
I'm excited that we have some things uh, moving along, that we are starting to uh, ha have some ministries come back together, and that means more announcements. And I know that you are excited about hearing about announcements. Uh, we sent out by email and some by snail mail a letter this week, a newsletter, with information about the next couple of months. I encourage you, if you've not yet, to read that. There's a lot of things happening here. Uh, first off, in the month of May, we are accepting deacon nominations. Uh, these uh, who are nominated uh, will start serving in the fall when our church here uh, begins anew. So uh, please take a look at those. You can fill a form out online. There are also hard copies on the board in the back. For nominating committee, uh, talking about our volunteer positions, uh, with everything being so different this past year, we're just going to ask all of those people who had any kind of volunteer position to prayerfully consider remaining in that position for the new church year. So that would be 2021, 2022. Um, if you need to make a change, would like to make a change, please see me directly and uh, we will talk through that and figure things out together. We had several people already donate towards our backpacks. Um, these backpack uh, kits are for students at Grundy and Jefferson. I think there was a typo in the newsletter. Um, there's still opportunities to give, and there are post-it notes on the backboard if you would like to do that. June 20th is a Sunday. We're going to have an outdoor service. Please pray for a beautiful day like we had last summer. And bring your friends and your family. We're going to be inviting our neighbors. It's a great way for us to uh, be in the community and um, giving them an idea of what we do here at First Baptist Church of Morton. On the 27th, we're going to resume some normal activities. Praise the Lord. We're going to have our Sunday small groups uh, meeting at 915 rather than 9 a.m. And um, then I, we're going to go back to having one service with us all in here worshiping together. Praise the Lord at 1030. I don't know if you can tell or not, but I'm a little bit excited about having all of the people together. It's going to be awesome. Uh, there's an opportunity for us to uh, get some help out to the community this coming Saturday. On Saturday the 8th, we need some people who have some trucks to help load some boxes of food. We did this a couple of months ago. Uh, it is free boxes of food that we can give out to our community. So we need some people with trucks. Uh, to, if you would like to help Pastor Ben uh, Saturday morning, contact him directly. We also need a crew here to help um, distribute those boxes, and that group would meet here at noon on Saturday. So if you're available to help on either end of those, we really appreciate it. And if you know of a family that could use um, a box of food, please contact the office and let us know, and we will help to arrange all of that. It's a great way for us to uh, do something tangible for those who have needs within our community. I'm excited about that. Um, I am appreciative of a pastor who preaches God's word. And um, I hope that uh, you are too and that you will encourage him so. Um, we've had that for decades, and it continues, and what a blessing it is. So um, thank you for being here today, and we're going to be dismissed now in prayer. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for how it applies to each and every one of us. I thank you that your word never changes, that it's always relevant, that you want the best for us. I'm grateful that you've given us your word that we can hang on to and learn from and use as we go about our daily lives. I pray, Father, that because of your word, because of you and your Son and your Holy Spirit, that we can be different and that you would help us to have the courage to be a light in a very dark world. Thank you for the opportunity that you've given us today to worship together. Thank you for the way that you love us. And thank you for Jesus. In his name I pray. Amen. Have a blessed day. Let's go.